Hello. Um, in any given year, you're going to have a lot of events. Even years that seem less eventful than others. I mean, we look at certain years as being particularly eventful, pivotal. 1989, for instance, um, would be an example. 2011 was a pretty eventful year as well. Um, so we tend to look at certain years as standing out. Um, but I would say that every year has significant events. You know, if you follow news extensively, world news as I do, every year has significant events. Just uh, talking about news, just a quick um, word. There was a horrible tragedy in Pakistan yesterday, the Karachi to Rawalpindi Express caught fire apparently there was an open gas stove or an open stove um, 73 people were burned to death horrible disaster certainly not the first such incident in Pakistan there was um, the not involving a train but there was a highway incident about two years ago a big conflagration over 100 people killed um, so that's uh, hopefully you know when these things happen hopefully it will pave the way for improve safety because apparently there's still a lot of complacency with that it's sad that it takes tragedies to do that but anyway um yeah so in recent weeks and months there's been protests basically around the world so can we call this global spring um it, it's it's got a ring to it but i don't think we can because unlike the arab spring protests of 2011 2010, 2011, which had generally similar themes in place where the issues was unemployment, human rights abuses and in most cases a desire for more democracy or better democracy. Um, there were running themes, food prices as well was a running theme there. But with these protests that have been taking place all over the world, each one is different in its context. Now, there are protests every year, um, but there does seem to have been more than usual this year I mean every year you're going to get protests somewhere in the world you're going to get some movement or something but this year 2019 has been particularly eventful in terms of people power in terms of people movement but I don't think it's comparable to 1989 or 2011 because like I say whereas those protest movements had a kind of generic theme these ones don't so just off the top of my head and I'll probably miss some places here but we've seen unrest protests in Venezuela Chile Britain Catalonia Spain um, Egypt Ethiopia Sudan Lebanon Iraq Russia Hong Kong Papua those are just, uh, I'm sure I'm missing places as well. Uh, France as well, if we consider the yellow shirt protest has continued into this year. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just some examples. There are probably more. And of course, there's always demonstrations somewhere in the United States. Um, Although I would say the March for Our Lives phenomenon was more uh, 2018, but still relevant today. Um, and the, the Women's March 2017. But if we just look at these things, I mean, where you have a running theme is discontent with ruling establishments, whether that be dictatorships or whether it be even democratic governments that are seen as incompetent or not providing a direction as is the case in the UK um, I mean the protests in this country are not about you know improving human rights or not even about oh we demand free speech and not even about unemployment as would have been the case with the anti-austerity protests this year it's been primarily Brexit you know remain and leave both sides have generated very large rallies um, and then of course you add Extinction Rebellion those demonstrations to that it's really um, it's really been a turbulent year for the UK France like I say it's a yellow shirt protests Venezuela it's the ongoing humanitarian crisis in that country um, Chile a range of factors there public sector workers on strike 
um, Catalonia it's uh, um, an identity issue is Catalonia to be independent is it part of Spain the most recent protests were um, for the exile leaders and then there was a counter protest from unionist Spaniards who say Catalonia is part of Spain um, similar to what we had in this country in 2014 with the Scotland issue um, but I would say a different response from the two governments um, Egypt kind of echoes of the anti mubarak protests this time against Sisi uh, Sudan people power against um, the dictator there which was successful but the transitionary military council you know is definitely far from ideal um, and that was bloody because over 100 people were mercilessly killed it it got some attention but I mean that that actually took place in the same week as the Tiananmen Square um, commemorations and it was pretty much Sudan's Tiananmen Square although it's a country that's had a very violent history um, still a very uncertain situation there Algeria uh, protests which were more peaceful I mean not resulting in violence um, the president uh, Bouteflika resigned um, stepped down um, then we have Ethiopia where the new Nobel laureate peace laureate ha is dealing with ethnic clashes in that country in the Oromo region over 60 killed um, Lebanon I haven't followed that one closely but um, discontent in that country in Iraq um, in Papua, again, it's uh, a, separatist, a separatist issue, human rights concerns around the, the way the Indonesian military has treated people there. And Hong Kong needs no introduction. That's probably been the most prominent of all. Um, you know, that, that good, uh, that's the one I followed most closely. Um, the protests against the anti-extradition bill against the extradition bill, excuse me, against what the protesters see as encroaching Chinese influence. Um, unfortunately, that's taken a turn whereby there is a hardcore of protesters that are basically just rioting, and in my view, they're playing into China's hands. Um, so those are just some examples. Um, Russia, anti-Putin protests. So this shows us that People are galvanised and no government, democratic or dictatorial, should underestimate the power of people, ang you know, public anger. Now that doesn't mean that there's justification, thinking of the British context, that doesn't mean there's any justification for threatening politicians' lives or anything like that. But people want to vocalise their their contentions. Sometimes I'm sympathetic to the particular movement, sometimes I'm not. But it shows that people are not ants. Even in totalitarian states, even in authoritarian states like Russia, people are not going to be silent. Sometimes these movements make a change, sometimes they don't. But no government can be complacent about this Dude, that doesn't mean you can have a situation where there's just unrest that just goes on with no end in sight um, I mean re thinking of the situation in Hong Kong one of the problems with Carrie Lam's response is she still refuses to acknowledge the role of police brutality there's still been no independent inquiry so talking about punishing rioters seems very unfair when there's been no consequences for police brutality and yes I know police have also been victims of violence there but this has built up over time um, and as for the Chinese response that's just predictable isn't it of course China recently relished the, um, the anti-Brexit protests the pro-Brexit protests and the situation in Catalonia because it gives them opportunities to point fingers in the wet at the West even though it's a very different situation, particularly the situation in this country. I was talking to a Chinese friend last night about the Brexit situation, and I, I don't mind talking about British politics to Chinese friends, but I'm always a little wary in case it comes up like, oh well, that's democracy, that's why we have our system. But you give me a messy democracy any day, even Britain today, with all the uncertainty we have, 
and I hate the current situation, but I would still take less over living in a one party system where I can't speak my mind. So there are some running themes with these movements. It's all discontent. It's all, you know, none of these are celebratory. None of these are taken to the streets that that's praise the government. At least not, okay, there was Chinese counter demonstrators. And in the case of the Turkish dictator Erdogan, he has his nationalists in different countries to promote the Turkish regime. But in most cases, it's about discontent. So that's interesting. I think with any movement, people need to be clear what their objectives are. It's not people can't just go out and riot or be angry. They need to be very clear. What are the objectives? What are we angry about? And what are we demanding? I think that's important. Otherwise, you, you can't criticise someone if you're not prepared to offer an alternative or to offer a solution as to what you're looking for. Um, Tony Blair once said that, you know, you can have the freedom of assembly, you can have freedom of speech, you can have free protests, but you need to have an alternative. And sometimes protesters don't always have that they they scream and protest they say how awful a particular government or regime is but they don't always sometimes they do that's one of the things i admire about the hong kong protests they have been very specific about what they want with other protests it's just kind of like spontaneous discontent and i mean the the riots in 2011 and across england a lot of that was playing opportunism. On the surface, it was anger about Tory austerity. I was angry about that. But when you got people setting cars on fire and burning people from their homes, um, I am seeing, I'll just close with this point, I am seeing a hardcore of Hong Kong protesters now who are basically just rioting. And I do think that the mainstream people including Joshua Wong and the others, need to distance themselves from that. If they don't do that, there's going to be a real problem here because the Chinese state is going to just say, oh, well, look, they're rioting. That justifies any potential crackdown that will come. And it will put Western governments in a difficult position because there is rioting going on and they can't say we support democracy and freedom of speech if the Chinese state's only going to show those images. And the, the, the problem here is the vast majority of protesters in Hong Kong haven't been rioters, they've been peaceful. Chinese state propaganda has ignored that. Um, so that's why it's important that legislators who are anti-Beijing, protesters um, who have been peaceful, and everyone who wants to stand up to the Chinese state but doesn't want to be smeared, they need to distance themselves from these people. They need to tell them to their face, stop it. You know, trashing businesses and burning cars, it's just hooliganism. That isn't going to achieve anything. You may be venting anger, but, you know, I mean, if you burn a pro-Beijing business, that isn't going to get them to see the light and get them to see the merits of democracy. No, it's just going to make them more stoic in their opposition to you. So I must admit I'm disheartened by the way the movement has turned. I don't regret supporting the movement, um, the wider principles, not for a second. And no Chinese propagandist should be under the illusion that because me, people like me kind of are not happy about the unrest, that we're suddenly that all oh, the protest is wrong. No, I still support the protest ideals 120%, and the vast majority of protesters have been peaceful. But, um, you know, rioting is just stupid. <laughs>